Welcome to Peggy Adams Animal Rescue League's disease prevention training class called What the Fomite. In this presentation, we'll discuss how diseases can be spread and why it's important that we do our part to limit the damage to the shelter animals and to our pets at home. So what is a fomite? Were you curious at all? Did you look it up? A fomite is any object or substance capable of carrying infectious organisms, such as germs or parasites, and transferring them from one individual to another animal or to another human. Take a moment to identify the fomites around you now. Your phone, your glasses if you wear them, your pen, all have potential to spread disease. There are other vehicles for disease transmission that we fail to think about sometimes. Our skin, our hair, our hands, our shoes, etc. So how are diseases spread? A common way for infectious diseases to spread is through direct transfer of bacteria, viruses, or other germs from one person or animal to another. We can identify these modes of transmission as airborne, direct contact, and indirect contact. Let's start with airborne. Ah-choo! Airborne particles from that very sneeze will linger in the environment and others could walk right through them. Direct contact is as though I've just sneezed again, but this time I covered my mouth and then I'm introduced to someone new. While I've protected the surrounding environment by covering my mouth, bacteria is now on my hands, and it is customary to shake hands when you meet someone new, right? This is direct contact. Finally, indirect contact. After meeting this new person, they go on to meet someone else, and they shake their hand, sharing what I gave them, and so on. As humans, we've been taught how best to limit the spread of disease from one human to another. We know less about how not to spread disease from ourselves to the animals. So how do we limit the spread of disease in the shelter and to our animals at home? Wash your hands often. This is especially important before and after preparing food, after handling animals without your gloves, and after handling bedding. Disinfect the hot zones in your residence or in the kennels, any area that might have infected animals. Providing a clean environment for our animals ensures their health and happiness while they're here at the shelter and at home. By taking the time to properly spot clean, deep clean, sterilize cages and kennels, and in between fosters, these animals get what we've promised, quality of life and comfort. Avoid close contact. This is a tough one for many of us to accept, but it's crucial that we avoid snuggles between animals. Each animal we touch or snuggle has the potential to spread disease via our hands, our clothes, our skin, our hair, etc. Even with our PPE, which stands for Personal Protective Equipment, Disease can attach itself, and changing out all of our PPE each time for each cage is costly in supplies and time. In most cases, changing gloves from cage to cage, kennel to kennel, will suffice because we're not snuggling. Use and dispose of your PPE properly. Be sure to note each room's PPE requirements and refrain from going into rooms where you've not been trained. There are designated rooms for upper respiratory, contagious skin conditions, kennel cough, quarantine, and so on. Going in and out of these rooms untrained and unprepared will spread disease around the shelter. We should also refrain from entering the kitten nursery and infant holding areas as they are critical care units and the fewer of us in and out the better. Follow cleaning protocols at all times. Don't rush and don't cut corners. If you need supplies stocked, ask. If you're missing PPE, locate some. Don't skip steps and risk the spreading of disease which can derail an animal's route to adoption. Do things the right way, because that's the only way to do them. We are here for the animals. Following protocols, asking for help, and using the tools provided will help the animals stay healthy while they go through the system and move towards a home. By the way, notice that we said limit and not eliminate. With so many animals and so many people on our campus, we can only hope to limit the spread of disease by being mindful of our movements and our actions around the shelter. This is an example of what a room's PPE requirements looks like. It's posted on the door. Please mind the rooms that require PPE at all times. To help us understand more about fomite transmission and the role that we play in it all, please view this video from Dr. Aaron Henry. This is a very detailed academic explanation of how disease is spread, who spreads it, and who is susceptible. We learned a long time ago not to dilute information for you but rather offer it to you in full so you can understand how your movements in the shelter affect the shelter animals, the public's animals, and your animals at home. My name is 
Dr. Aaron Henry, and today I'm going to be speaking to you about principles of disease transmission in the shelter. So first I'm going to go over a basic outline of what we're going to be speaking about. We're going to start out with why you guys should be so happy you came here today to listen to my presentation. Um, from that point and basically how this information is relevant to you guys as shelter staff and volunteers. And we'll go on to the different means in which uh, diseases can be transmitted, the modes, and what determines whether diseases are transmitted. <laughs> and we'll finish with some examples, and I'm actually going to quiz you guys on your knowledge and how much you've been paying attention during my presentation. Uh, we're going to apply some of the information I gave you to some of the more common shelter diseases. So, why do you guys need to know about disease transmission in the shelter environment? Well, I'm here to tell you that by knowing about the different ways in which diseases can be transmitted, you guys can better understand the protocols that the shelter management put in place in your shelter, you can also help to prevent disease outbreaks in your shelter environment because you play a very critical role. And lastly, a lot of you that are volunteers and staff have your own pets at home, and by knowing the different ways in which the diseases can be transmitted, you guys can keep your pets safe at home as well. So before we get into the different modes of disease transmission, we're going to talk about what determines whether or not a disease is actually successfully transmitted in the shelter environment. There are so many factors that come into play, but some of the most important ones include the susceptibility of the, the animal that's being exposed. There are so many factors that determine that. It could be the age of the animal, the vaccination status. I know Dr. Berliner was speaking about uh, early vaccination as they enter the shelter. Um, you also have to worry about the stress level of the animal. And again, your, your carrying capacity, et cetera, and the amount of stress that your animals are under. Um, also, the infectivity of the infectious agents in, that are being transmitted. For example, does it take one particle of infection to transmit the disease, or does it take 10,000? And uh, Dr. Lowry's presentation on disinfection and sanitation really kind of hits this point home as well. And again, route of exposure of uh, the infectious particles. So uh, did the infectious dose of the disease get exposed to the right area of the animal? Did it hit their hair coat and isn't going to start a disease, or did it actually hit where a disease can be started? So now that we have those basics, I know I may be going kind of quickly. I'll try and slow down a little. Um, we're going to move on to the different modes of disease transmission. So this is a huge flow chart, and it just goes to show that this can be kind of difficult. There are many different ways that these can be categorized, and this is just one of them that we're going to use today. So the first breakdown is vertical transmission and horizontal transmission. Vertical transmission implies that a disease is being transmitted from a mother animal to her babies. This can happen either while they're still in the womb, it can happen during delivery of the babies, or it can happen while they're nursing. So there's, there are actually a few uh, diseases in which this is pertinent, but we're only going to discuss one of them today, and the bulk of our discussion is going to be on horizontal transmission, which occurs when two animals of either the same species or a different species transmit diseases to each other, and it tends to be the more common way that you guys think about disease transmission in the shelter. As you can see, it gets further broken down into basically indirect transmission and direct transmission, which again is further broken down into other categories, which we're going to discuss in more detail soon. So first, let's talk about direct transmission. <laughs> uh, direct transmission, as you noticed on the flowchart, can be divided into direct contact transmission as well as droplet transmission. So as you guys can see here, direct contact transmission requires body surface to body surface contact between either animals of the same species or animals of different species. And it's kind of important to note that a different species, humans are also considered a different species, especially in the case of zoonotic diseases. Next we'll talk about droplet transmission. And droplet transmission occurs when infectious droplets, which can be of any sort of secretion, whether it's oral secretions like snot, etc., or feces that's been aerosolized, or urine, uh, when it leaves one animal's system and comes into contact with the mucous membranes of another animal. 
And next, I just have a little depiction of how droplet transmission can occur. So you can see that our infectious animal here on the right has just sneezed, and he has sprayed his infectious particles all around to these three animals that are within a few feet of him. And you can tell they're quite disgusted by this, of course. Um, but it's not only important to note that these animals have been exposed, but when he sneezed, he also exposed the environment, which is another mode of disease transmission, which we're going to talk about next. And that is indirect transmission. So indirect transmission can be broken down into airborne transmission and fomite or environmental transmission, as well as vector transmission, which we're going to discuss all of them. But we'll start off with airborne. And airborne transmission happens when an infectious particle uh, remains suspended in the environment. So really great example is dogs that are barking and coughing when they have kennel cough. They remain suspended in the air for a very prolonged period of time. And uh, they're capable of traveling pretty far distances and infecting uh, surrounding animals. Again, great example, barking dogs in the kennel. They're all barking. I'm sure many of you have walked through the dog runs in your own shelter and come across dogs barking, whether they have kennel cough or not. And again, it can be transmitted in that way. Uh, next, we'll talk about vector transmission, which is a disease-specific mode of transmission um, when the disease has to pass through another species before infect becoming infective to the animal that is kind of the host-specific animal. So the best example I could come up with of vector transmission, and it tends to happen a lot more in the southern shelters, is heartworm in dogs. It also happens in cats, but everybody tends to think of it mostly in dogs. So in order for a dog to become infected with heartworms, you need to have a mosquito vector. So in essence, you cannot have this infected in this guy without this pesky little mosquito. That being said, biological vectors such as mosquitoes are not the only way in which a vector can transmit disease. There are also ways in which, uh, in some instances, um, animals such as flies can carry disease on themselves and transmit it mechanically. For instance, in parvovirus, if you guys are familiar with it, um, if a fly is flying around the dog kennel, lands in a puddle of parvo diarrhea, and then flies his way over to the next dog's meal. Of course, you're familiar with how flies love to land on your own plate. Same thing happens in the shelter, and they can land in the bowl and actually transmit parvovirus. And that very, is very similar in, <laughs> in uh, theory to the next uh, mode of disease transmission that we're going to discuss, which is indirect which environmental and fomite transmission. In <laughs> indirect environmental and fomite transmission occurs when a susceptible animal comes into contact with a contaminated environment or a fomite. So these environments could be either a dog run that isn't disinfected between dogs if you bring ill dogs into your dog runs, or if your shelter likes to rotate kennels during the day and they're not properly disinfected. Another plug for Dr. Lowry's speech on disinfection and sanitation next. Or if you have a cat that was ill and maybe it got adopted out ill and you bring a new cat into that former cage and it hasn't been properly disinfected. And again, as the name suggests, not only is it possibly environmental transmission, but also fomites. Could I just get a show of hands? How many of you guys know what a fomite is? Pretty good, so about half of you guys. Don't worry, for those of you that don't know, I'm going to explain it. So a fomite is any object that's capable of transmitting disease from one infected animal and carrying it and transmitting it to another infected animal. There, and your shelter is chock full of fomites, whether it's a bucket that maybe gets disinfected once a week or maybe even not at all. When you clean cages, you can transmit via the mop and the mop bucket or say you have some awesome furniture in the dog runs for your dogs to learn how to get up and sit pretty on, makes them more highly adoptable perhaps. Um, that can be a fomite. You can have, if there are regular dog toys that are left in a dog run and everybody gets to play with them and they're not disinfected in between dogs, that can be a fomite. Even the pen that you guys like to use in your shelter, if you're walking around with a clipboard, you interact with a dog, and you get a rainbow of germs like Dr. Berliner was saying, all over your pen, 
and all over the doorknob. And it's important to note that not only are inanimate objects capable of transmitting disease, but there's also a really popular fomite, and there's actually a room full of them right now. And that's you guys. So diseases can be transmitted via you guys, whether it's on your clothing that you've been snuggling with a dog or a cat, and then you move on right on to the next cage and snuggle with another one, or if you're just walking around and petting them and you're, maybe you're in the isolation ward and you pet the sick cat that looks like it needs comfort and then you move on to the healthy cats and you decide, oh, let me snuggle with them too. You take your rainbow of germs on your shirt and on your hands and you can transmit it from one cat to the other. This is also a very important mode of transmission because it's actually how you guys can transmit diseases to your pets at home. So say you're spending your time at the shelter and you like to snuggle them and you're petting animals and then you can go home and your shirt, your hands, and for those of you who love to get puppy kisses on your face, you can bring all of those germs home to your own pets. Very important to note. So we've gone through this all very, very quickly and I went through the whole nitty gritty academic perspective of disease transmission. But now what we're going to do is I'm going to have you guys get your clickers out and we're going to try and apply this to the different, very common and some of the more concerning diseases in the shelter environment. So first we'll start off with canine kennel cough complex and I'm going to just as a little bit of information. I have all of the different types. There's more than one right answer for each of these. So just go with what your gut is and what you think is the most important. So just a little word about canine kennel cough. How many of you guys have that in your shelter? Just a show of hands. Or have at some point. You've noticed a dog that coughs or sneezes and has little snots dripping from him. So canine kennel cough, as you might think, is transmitted through the different secretions that come out of the dog's face. So through sneezing, coughing, all sorts of oral secretions, etc. So based on that little bit of information, what do you guys think would be the most common mode of transmission? And let me open this for polling. Or you can go ahead and... All right, the polling has stopped and let's see what you guys had to say. So... About 6% of you said direct contact, uh, 78 said indirect contact via airborne transmission, uh, 15 were indirect fomite transmission, and 1% of you said indirect vector transmission. Very good guys, you're, you're on your game and you're obviously paying attention. So some of the most important means of transmission are direct contact, airborne transmission, and fomite transmission. And I could see where perhaps a vector transmission could occur via mechanical. But again, most importantly, airborne, if you guys have ever been in the run area where the dogs are barking, some of them are coughing, etc., definitely an important means of transmission. And direct transmission is definitely of concern as well. It tends to happen more in shelters where dogs are communally housed or they're allowed to participate in play groups or just play dates between dogs and they're allowed to have that one-on-one -on -one contact with each other. Uh, indirect fomites, again, just as we had discussed, I kind of gave you the hint earlier in the presentation that if you're snuggling with a dog with kennel cough and then you go and snuggle a healthy dog, perfectly capable of transmitting the disease. You guys are off to a great start. So let's move on to the next one. We're going to, oh, hang on, i got to hide this. All right, so how many of you guys are familiar with parvovirus? It's a very, very important disease, especially in puppies, tends to cause really bad diarrhea and can even uh, kill poor puppies. <laughs> so given that, uh, the infectious particles tend to be transmitted in the feces and they're actually pretty hardy and pretty sticky too. So not only are they, can they be dispersed in the feces, they actually can get stuck to the hair coat as well. So given that sort of information, what do you guys think the most common mode of transmission of parvovirus is? All right, let's see what you guys had to say. So we got 29% direct contact, 6% indirect airborne, 45% uh, indirect fomite, and 17 indirect vector, and 3 vertical transmission. Good, so we've got a pretty good spread. Uh, 
you guys definitely touched on the ones that I would have would have definitely focused on the direct contact indirect fomite and then again vector transmission since I mentioned it earlier one other thing about parvovirus uh, just kind of a little factoid how many of you guys know how long parvo can stay in the environment anyone very good. So parvo is a very, very hardy virus, and it can last up in the, in the environment for months up to even a year. And so if you bring a puppy into your play yard, a new dog that seems to have a little bit of diarrhea, and that turns, in, turns out to be parvovirus, how long do you need to worry about that being in the, the run? And that's quite a while. Definitely need to focus on disinfection in that area, because if you have a puppy, say that puppy came in in March, and then another puppy that's susceptible comes in in August, there's still a chance that that puppy can be infected. Right, very. Is that even with like bleaching? I guess. So if you take proper disinfection techniques, it definitely lessens it. Lessens it, but yep. still a so I'm good. Yep. So I'm going to harp on staying around for Dr. Lowry's presentation and learning all about disinfection and sanitation next. She's very excited to talk to you guys about it. <laughs> So before we move on, we're actually going to move on to cat diseases, two of the more important cat diseases. And how many of you guys know uh, what disease is kind of similar to canine parvovirus in the shelter? Very good. Feline pain leukopenia. I can't put anything past you. Can I get a show of hands of how many of you know what feline pain leukopenia is? It's okay if you don't. The other common name for feline pain leukopenia is feline distemper. It's kind of a tricky name there. Wrong button, sorry guys. So feline pain leukopenia, just as with parvovirus, tends to be secreted in the feces. Um, although in the most acute form, so really early on in the stages of pain leukopenia, it can be excreted in all of their body secretions. So given that sort of information, we're gonna open the polls and you guys, keeping in mind that it's very similar to parvovirus, what do you guys think is the most common mode of transmission? Oh. All right, so let's see what you guys had to say. 65% of you think indirect contact or fomites, 24% direct contact, 8% uh, indirect airborne, 1% mm, say indirect vector, and 1% say vertical transmission. So very good, again, focusing on the indirect fomite transmission, very important, especially if you have kittens going into foster homes and they're not necessarily, their health status isn't necessarily known. Um, direct contact you have to worry about, especially in communal cat housing shelters. I, I know there's a big movement towards that sort of housing for cats. Um, indirect airborne, maybe possible, but not necessarily as much because do cats sit there and bark their heads off and kind of spew everything everywhere? I guess maybe they're meowing, but their, the force behind their vocalization isn't necessarily as strong as a dog's. Um, vector, again, possible, similar to parvovirus. And one other little thing I wanted to talk about, so you, I mentioned earlier to you guys that we were going to mention one disease that can be transmitted vertically from the mother to the baby, and that's this one. So feline pain leukopenia can be transmitted in the womb from the mother to the babies, as well as at delivery or via lactation. And one important note is that vertical transmission in utero does not cause the same clinical signs as you would get in horizontal transmission. Does anybody know what it causes? Very good, a neurologic issue called cerebellar hypoplasia. So those of you that aren't familiar with it, and they're actually kind of cute and it's sad to say that, but it produces a very wobbly kitten that when they try to do something, their head shakes or they kind of wobble over. Um, it can cause that issue in them. You guys are very, very good at this. So we're going to continue on to the next one. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we're going to continue on to feline upper respiratory tract diseases. So similar to kennel cough, they are secreted in all of the eye, nose, and oral secretions that are produced by the cat, um, though there are many different uh, infectious agents that can cause feline upper respiratory tract disease, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with. Um, so the different oral, eye, and 
and no secretions can spread it. So let's see what you guys think in terms of most common modes of disease transmission. All right. Let's see what you guys had to say. Very good. So 7% direct contact, 54% indirect airborne, 38% uh, indirect fomite, and 1% indirect vector. So pretty good. Um, one thing I want to take a chance to clarify is that airborne and droplet transmission is not the same. So again, with these guys, so dogs tend to transmit it via air, uh, airborne transmission because they bark and they set, shed thousands of micro droplets, tiny little things that get aerosolized, kind of like an aerosol spray. Whereas cats, the coughing, they don't tend to really cough. Um, they tend to sneeze more. And if you think about the pictures that they have of, of people sneezing, they have the kind of time lapse. I tried to find one of a cat sneezing so you could kind of see how big the particles actually are. They don't tend to travel as far. So airborne is not necessarily as common. Uh, but droplet is, and I kind of led you astray by not actually including it in my answers. But very good in that indirect fomite transmission definitely happens, as well as direct contact, especially in the communal housing setting. We're going to go on to one last example. So if I can hide this. Um, we're going on to dermatophytosis. Who knows what dermatophytosis is? It's a big word for anyone. Ringworm. So you can see the little circles on this dog's head. Yes, not actually a worm, it's a fungus. And it's a skin issue. I'm going to leave you with that. There are spores that uh, are shed into the dog's fur coat and onto their skin and can be left in the environment. So given all of those helpful hints, what do you guys think is the most common mode of transmission? All right, let's see what you guys had to say. So A, direct contact, 51%. B, indirect airborne, 11%. C, indirect fomite, 37%. And E, vertical transmission. Good, guys. Not too bad. So definitely direct contact, especially, again, in the communal housing setting for dogs or cats. And definitely, again, hitting on the fomite transmission. So going from people or blankets that aren't properly sanitized. Little plug for Natalie's wonderful presentation. I want you guys to stick around for hers too. Um, and vertical transmission, you know, I didn't actually think of that, but definitely possible if you have a mother with ringworm and there are kittens nursing on her. Definitely a possibility. Airborne, I'm sure a lot of you, ha you're probably thinking in terms of vents and the airflow through the shelter. That's a very good thought. Um, again, harping on Natalie's presentation, uh, good sanitation good sanitation techniques and disinfection uh, can help to really prevent this. And as long as you have a good filter on your, your ventilation systems, it shouldn't be much of a problem, but it is definitely a concern for most people. All right, so you guys did a great job doing all of this. And all we have left are my take-home messages. So in conclusion, I'm going to leave you with my top four take-home messages. I know there are only three listed, but I have four. And first, it's that as a volunteer or a staff member, you guys play a crucial role in disease transmission in the shelter, and there's so much that you can do to help prevent disease. Uh, second, there's many factors influencing whether or not a disease is transmis uh, transmitted, uh, as we were discussing, infectivity, patient status, etc. cetera. Um, third, as you guys might have noticed throughout our, my presentation, that fomite transmission is very important. And Therefore, since you guys can be fomites, it's very important that you're a mode of transmission as well, and it's very important to recognize that. And lastly, uh, different shelter setups, as you might have noticed, can promote different modes of disease transmission. And it's important to think about how your shelter is set up and what the most common mode of transmission would be for certain diseases in your shelter specifically. So with that, uh, I wanted to thank AS the ASPCA and Maddie's Fund for putting on our conference this weekend. So what does this mean for you at home? 
Regarding your clothes, use regular laundry detergent when you get home from work or from volunteering. If you're a foster and you're dealing with the bedding, regular laundry detergent, hot water, and bleach if you prefer should do the trick. Very soiled laundry should be thrown away. For your shoes, you can use Rescue or wash them in a regular laundry detergent. We recommend that you change the, at first when you get home and before you leave and perhaps have shoes specific for the shelter. While at the shelter, wash your hands, change your gloves, use hand sanitizer between animals and mind your PPE requirements. Those handling dogs should ha wash their hands between walks as often as possible. Oh, and rescue to the rescue. Rescue is available for free to all foster parents. And if you need some, you can visit the foster lobby in the domes. All other volunteers and staff are invited to purchase a bottle for $7 in the Grace Pavilion lobby. Rescue is the preferred product used at the league. It's more effective than even bleach. So to bring this all home, here are some tips and take home messages. Take advantage of the league's wellness clinic and make sure your pets at home are up to date on their vaccines. Use Rescue at home. It's safe and effective. Take your time at the league and focus on your role. It's easy to feel overwhelmed and to start moving too quickly. This is when mistakes happen and diseases are spread. This training isn't meant to frighten you or turn you into a germaphobe. Spreading disease is the risk we take each time we leave our homes and go out into public. Given our industry and the number of animals we care for, there is a heightened risk of picking up and spreading disease. Be mindful, even when your mind is full. Protect the shelter animals and your animals at home by focusing on the task at hand. Take your time, ask for help, use the tools, and help your teammates. From June 2016 to December 2017, hosting these trainings has helped reduce the spread of upper respiratory infections from 43% to down to 26%. Our intake protocol now includes vaccinations. We test on all cats and kittens. We test on all foster kittens at four weeks and then every two weeks after for panleukopenia. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please get with your immediate supervisor, manager, lead, or director for support. If you don't know who this person is, take action and find out. Thank you for your careful attention during today's presentation. Please click the next slide to take a short quiz to test your knowledge. And remember, spread love, not disease.